All right. Uh, who here has uh, heard of SaltStack before? Like before today? Okay, okay, good. Who here has played around with SaltStack? All right, we're down to 40%. Who here has SaltStack in a major installation? Excellent, we've got some. <laughs> All right. That helps me know exactly what to do, what to talk about, how to proceed, et cetera, et cetera. Now, they're loud. I need to get a jazz band in here. <laughs> this is, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> I was going to say this is New Orleans. I should have brought a jazz band. <laughs> okay, so let me start talking a little bit about salt. So the objective of this talk is really to give kind of an overarching view of salt as building blocks for infrastructure management, um, much more so than a bunch of demos. If you want a bunch of demos, I've got, uh, we've got a uh, birds of a feather in this room uh, after uh, we're done. What a great guy. <laughs> yeah, I do like him. <laughs> okay. So, so let me start with a quick history of what SALT is, where it came from, what some of those core ideas of SALT are. And it really helps to, I think at least, clear up or define a lot of uh, how it works, why it is what it is. But so the original idea of mine for SALT was that uh, I wanted to create a system, and I'd been working on this idea for a few years, to make it so that I could send a command out in parallel to large numbers of systems and get and get information back from them in parallel at breakneck speed so that I could then use that information to make decisions, okay? And so I'd made a couple of these remote execution platforms for different jobs. Um, I made a couple for the U.S. intelligence community. Um, I used to be able to say that, I, that stuff I worked on wasn't in the news, but I can't talk about it, so don't ask. Now, um, <laughs> but so I started on SALT after I left, um, well, when I was in a job where I could start writing some open source software to try and get this, this idea, this design of a remote execution engine going. And that was the, or the origin, really. It was in my basement, me writing code to just kind of fulfill this idea of, I bet if we could really make remote execution this fast, then we could do all sorts of crazy things. And so that, again, that's really the foundation of the project. Now, from there, everything blossomed into saying, well, we can do fantastic things. We can come in and put configuration management on top of this remote execution bus. We can come in and put cloud management tools on top of it and uh, complex reactor systems on top of it, things of that nature. And then that last one, the goal of SaltStack Incorporated is to make money. It's a company. Um, it's not a foundation. But I will talk about uh, that strategy a little bit in conjunction with the fact that we stay completely open source. Okay. Now, the vision behind SaltStack is really this idea of state and flow. These concepts being that flow is remote execution. It's your ability to go out and grab data, modify your system on the fly, anything that you want to do, and make it happen at ridiculous speeds. And then state is the idea of saying that we can ensure that a system is in a certain state, set a system up in a certain state. And that those two concepts are, again, this foundation to say we can do that so we can do anything that we want to do to the infrastructure. Now, I, <laughs> I like this second bullet. High-speed communication needs no need, means no need for a CMDB. We've had, we've had a number of users out there who have previously used a configuration management database and then junked it to just say, well, now we can just ask our infrastructure what's going on. And we've got a number of users out there who use SALT to hook into a CMDB. And so that flexibility is something that's really, really important. The goal of SALT is that it can be dropped inside of any infrastructure and make it better less than saying, here is a uh, static prescription of what an infrastructure should look like, and more of saying, I'm just going to try and make your life easier, because 
your life is different from everybody else's life that we've, that we've looked at. Okay. So, this idea, this what is salt, um, we get compared to configuration management tools a lot. And that's primarily because that's where most of the interest for the project comes from. Well, I shouldn't say most, but okay, most. Is working in the configuration management space. But one of the things that's really important to understand about SALT is that it's more of a concept of these building blocks. I think I saw his phone ringing. He, he wasn't just leaving because I'm ugly. Okay. So it's this concept of building blocks for an infrastructure. And the, and the idea behind this is to say that SALT is a tool that can be used to solve whatever problems you're facing in your infrastructure, regardless of what your infrastructure looks like. Whether your infrastructure is a couple of machines out on um, Rackspace Cloud, there's Rackers in here, and I don't think there's any Amazon guys in here, so I'll try and be nice. Um, or if your infrastructure is LinkedIn, or a large university, or a supercomputer. And so these building blocks allow people to do specific things in their infrastructure to solve specific problems, which is why we go back, we look at somebody like Wikipedia. Um, and I, I love those guys. I mean, and not just because they're Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, but they deployed SALT for continuous code delivery. They didn't deploy SALT in production for configuration management. They manage another configuration management system using SALT. They use SALT to trigger those executions. And again, they hook SALT into their Jenkins server so that when a build is done, the build can communicate with SALT and say, kick off a deployment. We've actually got a great uh, representation. We just finished getting the, the official SaltStack Jenkins server online. We were just using Travis until relatively recently. Um, and it does some pretty cool stuff with respect to auto scaling and auto cloud management inside of that, inside of that uh, environment. But so there's a lot of these building blocks. And so I'm going to walk through and I'm going to talk about these building blocks and talk to what they can be used for, how they can be used together, and why putting these building blocks together into one unit gives you a lot more flexibility and power with respect to accomplishing your end goals of building a fantastic infrastructure. Wrong button. I'm, f I'm fumbling all over the place. There we go. I, I found it. Now, this idea of remote execution, I've, I've already been talking about this, but this is really central to what SALT is and how SALT works. So the, I, the, the remote execution, how it works, is that we send out this very small packet of data with instructions down to all the clients, which we call minions, because it's more fun that way. Actually, I think it's extremely descriptive, that they're, they're minions, they're a little piece of software that does what they're told, very dutifully. and like a good minion, it's not very expensive. <laughs> now, it sends this tiny packet out and then asynchronously executes those routines. So the asynchronous aspect of this is really important because when you're executing a routine asynchronously, that master system that sent those little commands out isn't hanging on to those connections anymore with respect to those commands. The information about the return is returned to the master asynchronously, but since that's happening, it is irrelevant where that information ends up going. And so we're able to redirect the data flow of all of these executions. This is another great example. We've got quite a few users out there who use a system that's called returners, so that they're able to execute a routine in the environment and then have all those systems shoot that information back to, say, a Redis database or a MySQL database. Um, or, or any data. They're, they're all supported. They're all in there now, even though I want more Cassandra support. Is anybody here a Cassandra guy? <laughs> nice. Okay. <laughs> but so you're able to redirect and send that data back. So this basic model of saying command, run, shove the data somewhere is, again, the foundation. Now, the nice thing about the remote execution in SALT is that it's, it's tailored Yeah, see, now I've made a mess of things again. It's tailored 
to be very, very fast. And so what happens is that, uh, actually, we've got a great quote from, from Harvard University when they deployed us on one of their supercomputers. They came back and they said, it used to take us about 15 minutes using an SSH-based tool that was doing parallel SSH executions on our supercomputer. Uh, it took about 15 minutes to run a command and get that data back. Now we use salt, it takes less than five seconds. And so they find themselves, and, and many salt deployments, executing these commands on a regular basis, sending, sending information out to get real-time data about whatever they want. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the event system inside of SALT. Any questions or comments so far? I don't want any arguments. I'm tired. I got up early. Yeah? Okay, so you're asking... Uh, we execute routines on minions asynchronously. What if they fail? How do we know that they failed? Okay. If an execution fails, then it reports failure data back. So it sends, it sends a message back that says that this routine failed and this is why. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. So event-driven. Now this, you know, I'm, I'm normally better at this with this mouse. It's the humidity. Okay. Now, the event system inside of SALT. The idea here is that everything that's going on inside of SALT is happening on an, on an event basis. Now, the nice thing there is that everything can be run asynchronously. All we have to do is listen to events and then ingest them. And so on the master and on the minions, there's an event bus. Now, a privileged application can listen on the event bus or can even fire on the event bus. And we've got users who fire, fire events on SALT's event bus expressly to trigger reactions inside of SALT so that they're able to, again, hook in arbitrary systems, give them rights to fire on that bus, and then stuff happens, okay? But since it's event-driven, then we are able to create um, some, some pretty slick things. I mean, even the CLI, you run a SALT command, and the CLI program that you started is listening on the event bus for the information about those minions returning executions. But so the fact that it's event driven, we can again do cool things. So the new salt stack UI, I was really hoping that I would have cut the release candidate for this by the time this talk started. Um, but it's, well, delay after delay, it's done. <laughs> but I just need to cut the thing for the, for the not that 17 release. Uh, but that's going to come with integration with our new UI, which is open source. Uh, the new UI is, again, it's an entirely event-driven system. And so you plug in, and you just watch as Salt tells you everything that's going on on the fly. It's really, really slick. And it's one of the reasons why it took us a while to actually get it to work, because slick can be difficult. Yes? So a UI for the minions? You know, I haven't thought about that. Um, but it would actually be fairly plausible to put that together. So right now, yes, it's, 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 it's just for the master. Um, but Jen, if you want to, if, if you've got an application there, then give us an issue and We'll look into it. That's what we do. Um, we'd be nowhere if it wasn't for tons and tons of ideas. I mean, I can't come up with them all. Open source is awesome. Um, okay. So anyway, the new UI is available. It's out there now in the wild, and it does work. But the event system allows us to do some cool things. Yes? How is it going to change? Well, it, uh, what's it look like? Um, I was going to say, I'll, I'll set one up during the boss and show everybody. Or I'll, I'll try to, and it'll be very embarrassing, I'm sure. Because um, it's new and I haven't demoed it yet. <laughs> and we all know what happens with first demos. Um, but yeah, as far as your interaction with Salt, 
it need not change. Uh, we are still designing solve from the perspective that anything that can be done in the UI can be done on the command line. We're not doing any exclusive UI actions or activities. Now on the other hand, there are a number of more complex routines inside of SALT that, that I will talk about uh, that are going to be much more cleanly abstracted inside of the UI. So for instance, inside of SALT, there's the SALT vert system, which allows you to create a very, very lightweight cloud, private cloud, uh, using SALT, and there's SALT cloud. And a lot of those concepts can be difficult to ingest on the command line. And so a lot of that data analysis and view will be available on the UI. Is that what you're asking? Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, going back in and talking about the event system a little bit more, there's a system inside of SALT called the reactor. Now, the reactor is really slick, and this is, this is, again, one of those things where we're really taking a hard divergence away from the classical view of configuration management. But the, the reactor, if you enable it, it's off by default, uh, but if you enable it, it spins up a process on the master, and it listens to all of the events that are coming in. And then when those events come in, it, you configure it to say, I'm going to go use this logic to parse certain events, which makes it very easy to be able to say, if this event fires, then I can respond to it and go take care of that event. Now, a really good example of this is, um, again, I'm going I'm to use Jenkins, um, I think is a good example. Who here uses Jenkins? Wow, really? Well, what do you use? <laughs> what? Okay, okay, you win. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? Cheap City? Okay. Um, these examples could, lead, could logically work with other such systems. Uh, but so, what was it? Uh, no, same scenario, but use, using a Jenkins server when a build is complete, Jenkins is sitting out here on a minion somewhere, a build finishes, it fires an event on the master, the reactor is configured to listen to that event, and says, ah, a build of a certain type is finished, tell the minions that they need to deploy a new app. Or you could configure it so far as to say a certain type of event has finished, go spin up a bunch of virtual machines um, using Salt Cloud on Rackspace or DigitalOcean or OpenStack or CloudStack or those Amazon guys, um, et cetera, et cetera, okay? But so again, the ability to plug into the event bus react to real events and do it in real time. Yeah, yeah, e e bullets. <laughs> so yeah, just a couple more examples in here. Redirecting traffic, um, having events that can, that can get fired when, when something is down and then saying that we need to put traffic someplace else. Having, a, having an event get fired when uh, uh, when, say, you've got a data center that's getting overloaded and we need to expand the traffic pool to another group, things of that nature. Because the nice thing about the reactor is that it's sitting there on the salt master. You can, conf you can tell that thing to make any change to anywhere in your infrastructure as a reaction to any event that occurs. Does that make sense? Any questions here? The horse dead? Okay. Now... Execution modules. So now we're going to dive into a different part of SALT. So I mentioned earlier that the way it works, we send this little command out to the minions and then they run the routine, right? But the question is, is what is that routine? All these routines inside of SALT are in what we call execution modules. Now what these guys provide is this really big system management API. There's something like 150, 160 modules in there. I, I stopped, honestly, I stopped counting around 110. Um, but they contain, again, this vast library of routines that you can execute that covers everything from monitoring activity of specific applications, monitoring generic system activity, setting up users, installing packages, um, inter interacting directly with a MySQL database, 
it, it goes on. There's lots of them. Now, this is, this is one of those, it's the foundation library for all of our interaction routines. As we move forward, we'll see that configuration management, for example, is built on top of execution modules. The reactor that I just talked about is made to fundamentally execute execution modules somewhere. We use an execution module to fire off the configuration management system so that it's encapsulated and can be called from many, many other directions, making it very, very flexible and layered. Okay. But uh, let me actually open up a, uh, see I'm going to do this, I'm going to make a mess of something now. Or I'm not, well I got to be connected to the internet. I'll open up GitHub on this tiny, tiny screen. And if we go into the salt source, under the modules directory, we see all of these execution modules. Now the nice thing about these execution modules, apart from the fact that there are many, and you can see quite quickly as I scroll through a number of the things that they can interface with, uh, but they're also made, oh yeah, we actually have really good support for Windows. I know that probably doesn't matter as much to this crowd, <laughs> but it is there. <laughs> Okay, but these are actually made to be also really, really easy to write. And so they're just Python. All right, I may not have picked the best. Oh, that's a good example. So this is the generic service code, which is executing the init system, the classic system, the init system, to start a service. All you have to do is define a function and you're done. The function works. You don't need to inherit any classes. You don't need to bring anything in. You define a function. What it returns is what salt returns when you run that remote command. Okay? So they're made to be as easy as I've been able to come up with. If you come up with something easier, please share. We'll implement it. Okay. Any questions there? Yes. Uh huh. Sorry. Uh, we run on Python two six and two seven. So you do need Python two six on your client system to get it going. Um, we support back to RHEL five. So we primarily support upstream supported distributions. Okay. All right, so now we get to the part where people actually start caring, right? Everybody loves configuration management. Now, the idea behind SALT's configuration management was to make a configuration management system that doesn't skimp on the power. You can do anything and everything that you need to do in SALT's configuration management system but to still make it as simplistic and straightforward and easy to learn as possible, which presents some interesting challenges. And so that's, so we, we go in and we dive into what the config management system in SALT looks like, and it's all about data modeling and layers of data, so, and then you just interacting on a particular layer that makes sense to you that we try and make as easy as possible. And so, this makes it look complicated and hairy, I'm sure, but you only need to worry about, like, up here. The idea, though, being that, again, you can interface with the config management system on any level, which is great when you start diving down into how it actually works, or if you have a need to say, well, I just want to run these two state routines in my entire environment. I don't want to do a full run on everything. I just want to be executing this small set to make sure it's up. Or I just want to execute a single state routine in and of itself and then see what it's going to return or see where we're at there, which allows you to have some pretty granular um, controls over what's going on. But so as we work up these, uh, these different layers that exist in the data model, and then we get up to the top there, it's a system that we call the renderers, which is a word you don't need to remember. Um, but renderers just represent the way in which you define 
solve uh, formulas. And so since everything's data modeling, that means that how you define those is also technically arbitrary. Now by default, by default I get lost on GitHub all the time. There we go, that's what I wanted. Uh, everything is done inside of YAML. So I'm going to pick a random one, which I'm sure is going to be horrendous. Oh, that's not bad. So defining what it, what it needs to do can be very, very straightforward. We're installing libvert, and it's, well, it's running. Now the magic that we're doing right here is that we're able to embed some Jinja. And so in this example, we've got another a map file here that is mapping all these different platforms to what the package names are, okay? If you're only working on one platform, you don't need to worry about that. You just write libvert there. But these are made to be very generic. I'll open that. Seth made it crazy. Doesn't, you can just use an if-else statement. He, he wanted to be fancy. Okay. But so the end result here is that since we support templating inside of the YAML, we are, it is Turing complete. So you can do whatever you want to there. And also, it's very straightforward and easy to read. It's just YAML. So a basic understanding of YAML, which anyone in this room should be able to ascertain in five to ten minutes. Your grandmother it might take a half hour. It's YAML. Well, mostly because you'd have to explain to her what a dictionary and a list are. Okay. <laughs> so any questions there? Now these states that we're looking at here, there's this package installed and service running concept. So part of that question goes back into me getting lost on GitHub again. Oh, hey, it like went to where I thought it was going to this time. You know, one nice thing about giving a talk and using GitHub is that if you're looking closely, you'll see that during the talk, we've had something like six comments on issues in the last 10 minutes. I'm very proud and of our extremely active community. And the only reason it's been an hour is because I haven't been merged in any pull recs. I, I cleaned that out two hours ago. Very active community. All right, sorry, where was I going? That's right, execution, or state module. And so this is one thing that actually trips people up, so I, li I, I like to bring it up. So we've got these modules here, which is where all this one-off execution concept's coming from. But states are defined in state modules. And so when we say package.installed, what's going on inside of that YAML file eventually is that it executes. This is so not the right. <laughs> there we go. This function. Okay? That means that by its nature, they are self-documenting inside the code. Now, with that said, they're very well documented online. But the result is that these are the options that we can pass into package.installed. When we define them in that YAML file, they just get passed on into that function when it's executed. Okay. And then if we have time, because I'm sure I'm just eating up gobs of, oh, yes, gobs of time. So any questions about configuration management? Oh, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> any questions about this stuff? Is there anything in particular that you think merits a little more discussion before I move on at this rapid high-level routine? Yes.
somebody else brought XML up. Yeah, no one's ever asked for an XML one yet. But yes, the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> uh, but yes, that's the whole idea of this whole render system. Is um, let's say you love YAML but you hate Jinja. You can use Mako or somebody actually wrote a templating language that looks like Ruby templating so that it would be easier for his, for his puppet guys to transition over to Salt because they use this other language called Wempy. There's, uh, we ship with the PyDSL, which is a Python-based domain-specific language expressly for Salt. And we've got guys who use that. You can write them in pure Python, um, where what you do is you write a function that says run, and it returns the raw data. And we've got guys that use that. So yes, it could be written in XML, it could be written in Ruby, it could be written in C, it could be written in COBOL. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody wants to contribute a PHP renderer, I will happily accept it. I won't recommend it, it will go on the docs. <laughs> Actually, and let me show you what's involved in a renderer, I mean, while we're talking about it. So, to support Jinja, it's not a whole lot of code. You just chuck the stuff into Jinja. Um, the pure Python renderer, if I recall, has an impressive doc string and not a whole lot of code. So they're not, they're not hard to make, because all you gotta do is ingest a file Make sure it has a couple of values in it, and then spit the data back. It's not a big deal. We could have an XML renderer written by, you know, the end of the talk. Anybody up for that? We've even got a dictionary to XML library in here. Okay. Does that answer your question? Insufficient uh, and sufficiently obnoxious depth? Okay. Now. Um, this is a topic that comes up, I think, um, a little more obviously than I originally intended. So when I wrote SALT, I made SALT declarative, meaning you say this service requires this package. Only install, only try and start this service once we verify that this package is installed. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, and SALT was always made so that it will always execute in the same order. Now I'm very happy I did that because we had people come back and they said, well I want it to always execute in the order in which I write it in the YAML file. And my first reaction to that was, YAML's a hash map, it's unordered. Um, but they came back and so I made it not a hash map, now it's an ordered dictionary. And so in the next release of SALT, which I'm talking about, they will be evaluated in the order in which they're defined, and then those require statements for declarative override it, which means that it's really easy for you to say, okay, I'm going to list what, what state formulas are going to be executed. They're going to be executed in the order in which I include them. All the code in them is going to be executed in the order in which it's defined, unless I do one of two things, which is to say, yeah, but this service requires this package. Or you can explicitly define the order. You can say order last, or order one, or order 48. And then it'll make sure that those are evaluated at those positions in the ordering scheme. Does that make sense? The idea there being, especially with this new, we like it's called state auto order, it's a flag, you can turn it on and off. Um, but this new concept of being able to say that they execute in the order in which they're defined is again this goal to continually say, try and make it as incredibly easy to use and get going as possible, but not sacrifice any of that power. So this concept I'm talking about where we say this service requires this package, in SALT we call them requisite, and I keep hitting this thing. 
And we've got a number of requisites in there that do some nifty things. Require says what I just said. Don't try and start the service unless the package gets installed or unless this file has been successfully placed. Watch is what allows you to say the same thing as require, but um, restart this service if something gets changed. Okay? Uh, use says, I want to use the arguments from a different definition. And then prereq is kind of tricky. Prereq says, only run this state if you're going to change this other thing in the future. Which allows you to do something like, say, shut down Apache if I'm about to deploy code to this system. Or tell the load balancer to ignore me because I'm about to deploy code to this system. And then bring it back in when you're done. Okay? And it does that by looking into the future, by looking at that other state that it's observing and running it with test equals true in no op mode, basically, to say, are you going to make any changes? Does that make sense? Does that make enough sense? It was really confusing to write. I don't want to do that over again. Although, I, I am the guy who maintains that feature. <laughs> okay. So any question about ordering states? Yes. Okay. Do I have that on here? I talked about that. I talked about that. Okay. I don't think I have a slide for that, so I'll just explain. Now, how salt works is that it takes all of these, I'll just say YAML files, but however you get that data, okay? And makes a big O dictionary. Out of said big O dictionary, uh, what happens is that that, that that is called high data. Then we compile that down to a low state, which is a list of individual dictionaries which have all the information that's going to get passed directly into that function I showed you earlier, okay? Those get evaluated in order. And how they're eva and so the order in which they're sorted is defined by the order in which they're defined in the file, or the order keyword can manually shuffle them around. Okay? When they're evaluated is when requisites are used. So requisites are called at runtime, which means that you set up the evaluation order and then all your requisites fire on top of that. Does that answer your question? Sorry? You think so? Okay, well bother me later if it didn't and you're just being nice. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions on the whole config management thing? This guy may have been waving a five minute sign at me yet and I haven't seen him. Oh, he's, thank you. I'm paranoid. Yes? Okay, the question is, uh, how, how do we store configurations? Those can get kind of out of hand. And we use some crazy Git stuff, and it's kind of aggravating. Is that a good summary? Okay. <laughs> so I, I have to repeat the question for the, the thing. <laughs> okay, so what SALT does is, yes, yes, they're by default flat files on the file system on the master. But... Um, Salt ships with something with a plugin interface. Salt has many plugin interfaces. 
um, which we have not been able to talk about yet, but it ships with one called the file server backend plugin interface. The file server backend allows you to store that data wherever the devil you want and then retrieve it. And one of the backends that we ship with is called Git. We also ship with the Mercurial one, and we're not quite done with the SVN one, and the CVS one isn't going to happen. Now, what the Git file server backend does is it allows you to specify on the master that you're working with um, a number of different Git servers or Git remotes. And you're able to prioritize said Git remotes. And SALT translates the concept of a Git branch or tag into a SALT environment. And it does it all on your behalf. So all you've got to do is go to your SALT master and say, we store our formulas in these Git repositories. Look in this, and this is the order of evaluation. Now this makes it very, very easy to be able to go and say, all our stuff is in this Git repo or these Git repos. If you need to merge between environments, you just merge from, uh, right, your dev branch to your prod branch or however you do that. Um, and you can have that entire process managed in Git, which is, you know, made to manage that sort of process. And you never have to push anything back down to the file server, or sorry, to, to the salt master. Um, and then the benefit there being is that if you were crazy and you wanted to store all that data in Mongo, then you could do that. Yes? So the question on um, giving certain groups access to certain systems or certain parts of the system. Uh, SALT comes with a number of role access controls in it as well so that the remote execution systems can be, can be managed. So you can say, these users have access to run these functions on these systems. So that's all built in. With respect to saying, this group has access to create these um, these formulas inside of SALT. Uh, that, constru that construct isn't directly built in. We would rely on an external system like Git to take care of that for us. Unless you have an idea on a good way to implement it, in which case, I am all ears. I would love to have that built in. Yes? Yes. Um, it's actually quite straightforward. Yeah, just to find that your, uh, that your development servers are in the development environment, and they'll look at that branch and get done. No hairy anything to take care of. Okay. Any other questions? So, you know, I have no idea what time it is because Chris left. I'm doomed. So, I'll just keep talking. Okay. Um, all right, no, seriously, any more questions? Because I'm about to totally shift gears. All right, I'm going to shift gears. Um, now, the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is a concept inside of SALT called topologies. So the, the normal or classic SALT scenario is you've got a master, and it's got some minions, and you control them. But let's say you've got seven data centers. Or let's say you're spread across eight cloud interfaces. Or let's say you've got um, a big, big, big data center and you want to manage everything in individual groups. Let's say you're a university and you want to manage individual departments. There's all sorts of scenarios around this, okay? And so that's where the concept of the syndic comes into play. You can think of it as being short for syndicate. What it does is it's able to say that we've got masters Salt masters in different disparate locations that are managing their own sets of minions. And then the syndic is a little hook that ties it into a higher level master. Now this enables you to do things like say, 
I've got five data centers and I've got a single top level master that can control all of them, but really all the work is being done on those edge masters, which makes it really easy to be able to scale those things out. And basically how it works is that, um, is that all of the events that are fired on the master, which account for all of the data happening on your minions, gets aggregated into packets and then fired back up the line and then replayed on the higher level master. And you can send commands down from that higher level master so that it becomes very, very smooth in that you can still be shooting commands down the pipe. Okay? Does that make sense? I, I always fear that I, what I say doesn't make any sense. Sorry? Okay, so you can define the, so when you run something, you define a target inside of salt, and the target, you can use a glob, or you can use system information, or you can use roles, or all sorts of things. Um, and so if you define that target up on the master, then the target gets propagated down to the, to the edge master, and then utilized from there. Yeah, this higher level master sees all of these minions as if it was directly controlling them. Okay. And so it would make sense to assign a grain value in salt that they're called on all these minions to just say, I'm in data center foo. And then you can say, everybody in data center foo run this routine. Okay, I am just about out of time. And uh, I'm never out of slides. So um, let me cover really quickly a few concepts left and then ask you guys if uh, you have any questions or anything like that. Um, Saltvert is a concept of a super lightweight cloud. Um, it supports live migration, runs on KVM, is used in smaller environments. It's really not intended to be an OpenStack style cloud. It's meant to be a I just need to spin up some blasted VMs kind of cloud, okay? But it has no external dependencies like the rest of Salt. Um, it's made to be extremely easy to set up and extremely easy to use. And I assume it's going to get a little more attention when uh, uh, when our when the GUI comes out. See, I'm out of time. See, this is why this happens. <laughs> See, now I'm down to three. Chris is fantastic. <laughs> salt Cloud is our utility that allows you to integrate Salt directly with any external cloud. And so it supports these and a few more. Even that silly one down at the bottom that you haven't heard of. They're friends. They use Salt. They, it was contributed. I like X Mission. And then finally, one more thing that I want to mention is uh, SALT SSH is a new system that's coming in uh, the next release of SALT. It allows you to run all of the SALT configuration management and remote execution routines over SSH. Now the benefit here is that it makes it really easy for a really small environment um, where you don't need to worry about the fact that if you run parallel SSH across 5,000 servers, it takes forever. Um, but it makes it very easy to just manage it from anywhere. It makes it easy for a developer to manage a cloud from his laptop, be, you know, like a test environment. And then all those states that he's building for that environment will be naturally translatable over into a full deployment of salt. Um, or just to continuously manage a smaller environment. Also, it's it can be used to bootstrap salt. So you can run salt SSH with a scan routine and say, scan this subnet and just tell anything that will talk to me to install salt. Okay. But yeah, it's fully armed and operational. I've already had people come up to me and say, everybody's telling me it's only for bootstrapping. So no, no, it's fully armed and operational. Don't fly into the middle of it and shoot the triangular, then it blows up. Okay. Okay, somebody got that. <laughs> Somebody got my Star Wars reference. Has it really been like 20 years or 30 years? Whatever. Finally, Salt is open source. Um, we're not open core. 
We're not holding stuff back. We're not tying off features. That's not how we roll. Um, and we're the only guys out there that do this. Everybody else is open core. So I'm, I'm really proud of that. And I'm also very pr proud that we've been able to make money doing this as well. All right. Conclusion, salt's awesome. Any questions? Yes. How do we make money? Yeah? Okay. I would be happy. I would be happy to take it. Um, we, we are out of time, I believe. So if you need to go and you're annoyed by the sound of my voice, which is probable, you're welcome. Don't give me the bird on the way out. It hurts my feelings. Thank you.